All right. Matthew, I think it's okay for me to show this. <laughs> it's absolutely fine for you to show this. Rock and yeah. roll. No one, no, I'm not going to be the one to tattle on you, but at this <laughs> point, you're going to do anything you need to do. Well, I mean, it's been released, right? It's released, so it's yeah, there, there it's available. All right, fantastic. Um, well, I know we all just cannot get enough of Zoom, um, but in spite of that, I'm not gonna linger any more than I need to. I'm just gonna jump right into it. So um, today we're talking about viewports and um, <clears throat> somebody, I think it might've been Gail Rosenthal had um, mentioned this as a potential topic. So Gail, if you're there, thank you. Um, and uh, I thought, oh, viewports, I mean, you know, 15 minutes, we're done. Um, and then as I started outlining for today, I realized that uh, there's a lot of things about viewports that um, you, you've heard of the, the old saying about, you know, things that you know that you know and things that you uh, know that you don't know and things that you don't know that you don't know if you remember Donald Rumsfeld. Anyway, uh, viewports are things that I know that I didn't know. <laughs> There's just so, so much to them that um, we're uh, gonna have a lot to talk about. So um, there are a variety of different viewports and fundamentally the whole purpose of a viewport is to leverage your model. So, you know, um, for those of us in architecture, um, the buzzword, um, I think it's by now so worn out that it can no longer be a buzzword, but something we've been talking a lot about in the profession for decades now is BIM, building information modeling. And then um, in the landscaping world, there's now um, the term site information modeling. And then I know that there are some uh, uh, theater people who may be on this call or people from other uh, design disciplines. So you know, we can just call it uh, project information modeling is sort of the fundamental underlying principle beneath viewports, which is to say, I develop a single model as much as I can, and then the whole uh, uh, efficiency and effectiveness in the design process is in leveraging as many possible views from that model as I possibly can so that really I'm limiting the amount of time that I'm spending drawing unique uh, drawings and I'm creating a comprehensive model and then getting extracting all of my views from that. You don't have to limit viewport use to that. In fact, at the very end, I'll show a really kind of uh, um, pedestrian uh, 2D set of drawings uh, using viewports. Uh, but that's a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. And that's applicable whether your discipline is architecture or machine design or theater or landscape or you know, it, something else um, that I've uh, egregiously neglected to mention. So um, let's, let's just start with an ordinary plan viewport. So um, this is um, essentially a what appears to be a two-dimensional drafted drawing. And uh, if we look at the anatomy of the viewport, if we click on the viewport and then we look at it in the object info palette, all right, you'll see that there's a shape tab here. And I'm gonna minimize everybody so that I'm not looking past you. I know you're all there and you're fan you look fantastic. Um, Anyway, uh, so if we, if we double click on this viewport or if we go to uh, some of the edit options that are available in the object info palette, uh, we have a variety of uh, different options, right? We can uh, edit the annotations of the viewport, uh, we can look at the crop, or we can navigate back to the design layer or layers that populate this viewport. Or if there is a camera associated with the viewport, we can go back to that camera view, more about that later. Um, so before I get into that, I wanna point out that this viewport is living on a sheet layer. And um, I like to have my uh, layer scale show up right here. 
And you can see that in that toolbar here where I click on layer scale, sheet layers always have a scale of one to one. But the viewport obviously has a scale that's associated with it that you can get from this pull down menu when you first create the viewport or you can edit it and change it later. Um, and so that's how we represent drawings at scale on sheet layers because the sheet layer, as I said, is always at one to one scale is that we assign a scale to the viewport. And if I were to start, say, dimensioning this viewport, so if I just dimension this uh, garage right here, I probably did a really sloppy job of dimensioning it, but you can see that it's, you know, five and three quarter inches, not really, uh, I missed the wall, but that's obviously not the actual dimension because I'm dimensioning this, this drawing that's on a one-to-one -one sheet layer. So if I wanna get my dimensions to be correct, I need to go into the annotation space of that viewport and that's where these dimensions and notes reside. So the viewport has, a, has an annotation space, or I don't wanna use the word layer because layer means something else in Vectorworks. Uh, but the, the viewport has an annotation space that's affiliated with it. And that annotation is always at the same scale as the viewport itself so that your dimensions are, are right. And if I you know, am so bold as to take this viewport and drag it aside, um, there you go. Uh, you can see that um, everything in this drawing that you see is affiliated with that viewport. So it's either on the design layer or the, the design layers themselves that are populating that viewport or it's uh, in the annotation. Uh, another thing that viewports have is a crop. So here I'm, I'm inside the crop shape uh, for that viewport. Uh, and the thing about crops is I can only have one crop per viewport. And uh, that crop wants to be what Vectorworks refers to as a surface. So anything that if I were to give it a fill, it would, it would go ahead and fill. Well, it's a crop, so crops inherently can't fill. But if this were a normal rectangle and not part of the crop, if I gave it a white fill here from the attributes palette, you could see that it would obscure the drawing, right? And Vectorworks doesn't want me to have multiple crop objects, but they can be rectangles, they can be circles, they can be ovals, they can be polygons, polyline, anything that is a path that closes and contains a surface. Um, but it can't just be four lines that meet at the corner. It has to be an actual surface object, right? Um, and then it's really useful to, to crop viewports. And I'm sure that as, um, as, as we proceed today, there'll be some other examples of some of some crops. So those are the three essential ingredients of a sheet layer viewport. There's the, the viewport itself is populated by one or more design layers. All of the design layers, regardless of their native scale, are displayed at the scale of the viewport where they're displayed. Uh, then there's an annotation space where I would normally dimension and add notes. Why do I do that in the annotations instead of doing it directly on the design layer? Well, the reason is, is that remember the whole, the whole purpose, the fundamental purpose of viewports is to model something once and then extract as many views of it as I possibly can. So I'm gonna use this same uh, design layer uh, model geometry, the walls, the windows, the floors, the roofs and so forth to generate um, floor plans, reflected ceiling plans, roof plans, foundation plans, framing plans, you know, just a variety of different uh, drawings. And if I had all of those dimensions on the design layer, then they would show up in every one of my drawings. And I don't necessarily want that to be the case. I just want my architectural dimensions to be on my architectural floor plan and, and nowhere else, if that, that makes sense. So that, that is like a quick thumbnail um, kind of concept of your, your basic viewport. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of times viewports are being used to produce plans in some version or another. Again, floor plan, reflected ceiling plan, whatnot. Um, so here again, I've got some annotations. So that might include, now I'm inside the annotation space for the viewport. I just use a save view. You'll notice I've got essentially my outline for today's talk just as a series of numbered save views. That way I don't forget things, but I could just double click on this viewport and go right to this annotations with the edit viewport dialog box, gets me to the same place. So here are dimensions, 
Here are notes, right? Uh, some text blocks, some detail keys uh, that got flipped around when they migrated to uh, uh, 2021, but no, no worries. Some data tags that um, call out doors and window types and numbers, uh, just some plain old text blocks, some um, uh, annotations that are called, or in this case, a callback that go back to a database. Right? Anything that I would possibly want to annotate my drawing, um, I would put, logically enough, in this annotation space. Um, so that's, that's your basic anatomy of your viewport. Now, there are some cases where a viewport may not do everything that you um, want it to do. So let's see. I don't think I actually want this one. Oh, sure I do. There's my group. So here's a case of another viewport, right? Um, and what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at the parapet and ceiling and roof structure of this little building. I'm looking at it from the ground looking up. So this is quite literally a reflected ceiling plan. You can see that in the viewport, let's go back to that previous viewport. You can see that in that previous viewport under the uh, view here in the object info palette, right? I've got a top plan view. So a top plan in Vectorworks, of course, means that not only am I seeing things from the top, but there's no perspective projection, uh, projection on that. Everything is orthogonally projected. Moreover, any hybrid objects, objects that have a variable view, depending on whether you're in a 2D view or a 3D view, are generally gonna represent in their 2D view. So a great example of that is a door swing, right? If uh, the, the typical convention for doors is that they're open 90 degrees with an arc in plan, Right. But if I, instead of top plan view, if I were just in top view, then I would just see the 3D model of the door, including the door hardware, and I don't particularly want that, right? So in this case, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at over here is that I've got a, a viewport, but instead of being top plan, right, or even top, it's viewed from the bottom. So I'm looking at that viewport from underneath. And um, the reason I'm doing that is that there's some geometry in this viewport um, that isn't really going to show properly if I were just in a top plan view, because ultimately what I want to do is create a reflected ceiling plan. And so I'm for a reflected ceiling plan, I'm looking up at the ceiling, showing all the lighting and the switching, obviously, right? Uh, that's pretty self-evident. Uh, but you can see that what I actually have here is I have one viewport and then if I draw that aside, you can see that I have this other viewport that I created um, underneath it. So in this case, I'm superimposing two different viewports in order to achieve uh, the drawing that I want. And that can be kind of a nice little trick that you can do if um, uh, particularly, I find that particularly useful for roof plans. Um, where you may want to show all of the roof geometry and even render the roof texture, but I might have a separate viewport with the walls for that building just shown dashed. Um, so I don't know if I've got a good example of that in this case. Um, so this is just a regular um, standard kind of a viewport. I haven't um, flipped anything or mirrored anything. I'm not looking at it from, from the bottom. It's just a, a top plan viewport. Uh, but what I might do in a viewport like this, it might be uh, interesting, for example, here we go. Here's a, here is my uh, roof framing plan. I think I've got a foundation plan in this file. Yeah, terrific. So this is something, another valuable thing that you can do with your viewports. Um, more of a concern where I've got a slab foundation. This is uh, a perimeter grade beam with a wood truss flooring foundation, so it's less of an issue. But oftentimes, I'll show plumbing dashed um, on my foundation plan. That way, um, the engineer hopefully knows 
uh, not to run a grade beam right where I have a major plumbing line, because um, that can be a bit tricky to deal with uh, in the field. And so what uh, another advantage of viewports is that I populate the viewport with a variety of layers, right? Here are the layers that with the little eye icon that are populating that viewport, but also classes. And wherever I have this um, little eye, then that class is turned on. Wherever the icon is just, um, it's kind of hard to see, but the vector works icon, then that's just the regular class definition that is unaltered. But if you look over here for plumbing fixtures, um, I've modified that class. So for this viewport and this viewport only, anything in the plumbing fixture class is going to have no fill and a dashed line of a particular line weight. And so I'm overriding the standard class attributes and I'm making it gray. And so by doing that, um, these plumbing fixtures are showing up dashed on this foundation plan. Again, less critical here in this case, but, but important for um, a slab on grade condition. Um, so I just been talking an awful lot and I just want to see if there are, if anybody has any questions so far. All right. Well, if you do, please uh, feel free to chime in. Um, uh, but th that is another value of viewports, again, as I was saying, is that you can take your regular design layer geometry and you can uh, edit it to a certain degree. Um, so um, there's a couple of other ways in which I can, I can alter uh, in some subtle and not so subtle ways the geometry. So this is another planned viewport. It's uh, on a different layer. And um, as you can see, what I've done is um, uh, I've got some, I've got a scale, I've got um, uh, notations, right? I've eliminated a lot of the dimensions. I've simplified the annotations considerably. It's a separate, it's a separate viewport. But you can see that I'm instead of a wireframe rendering, which is uh, what we had for the previous viewport, I've chosen a sketch rendering for this viewport. And there are a variety of sketch rendering modes uh, out of the box. I've got rough, careful, quick, tentative, surface, uh, certain rather. So, you know, rough looks like this, for example. I can just hit preview and it'll re-render it. And so it looks quite, quite shaky, um, like uh, ink on a uh, cocktail napkin, perhaps. Um, or I can be a little more certain. Right, so, so that's one easy way that you can quickly um, alter the appearance of your viewport without having to fiddle with any classes or layers. You just put it in a sketch mode. And that's valid for a planned viewport like this or um, um, a perspective or an elevation. Any number of types of, of views can be, can be sketched up like that. Um, another way that I can um, deal uh, or manipulate the graphics of a viewport is with a relatively new feature. I think this came out the uh, last version of Vectorworks 2020, perhaps 2019, uh, might be 2019, uh, called data visualization. Um, and we've discussed this in, um, in other user group meetings, so I won't get too far into it, but here I've got a series of flat roofs and just looking at the drawing, I don't necessarily know a lot about what those roofs are made of um, other than whatever I may happen to annotate, but uh, they all have a consistent, you know, I've got, I've got drainage assigned to those roof slabs. So they've got slope and, and all of that good stuff, but I don't necessarily know what they are. Um, with data visualization, what I can do is I can take uh, that same viewport and uh, if I click on it, you can see that um, I have a, uh, doo -doo -doo. Um, of 
course. It's going to take me a second to find it. <clears throat> I have a data visualization right here in the object info palette. And uh, by default, it's set to none, and that's what that looks like. Uh, but I created a data visualization uh, called Roof Slab Styles. So what that does is it looks at all of the different roof slab styles or slab styles in the drawing. And different slab styles have a different color coding. So uh, we can look a little bit at to what that means. So let's go ahead and um, edit the data visualization. So there's the roof slab style. And what we've done is we've defined uh, the criteria. In other words, we're asking in this viewport, uh, what is it that we're interested in sort of looking at? And in this case, we're looking for objects whose type is a slab. Uh, so that could be a floor slab or a roof slab. That's a type of object in Vectorworks, right? And then uh, for the display criteria, I could show every single object or objects using uh, a certain IFC industry foundation classes uh, entity or a particular record or some other parameter. In this case, I'm using a function. So I'm applying a Vectorworks function to this rule set, if you will. <coughs> And uh, the function is the object style name. And so every object that has a style affiliated with it is being um, color coded inside this drawing. <clears throat> but I'm going to just, uh, uh, you notice there's like different window styles, there's um, detail styles, there are foundation styles. I'm going to ignore all of those and I'm only going to look at the styles that are relevant to roof slabs. So there's a flat roof truss that's 18 inches deep. That's one style. And then I've got a, a frame roof porch style. Now, if I had named those more consistently, they would be all together. And I can auto color. So Vectorworks assigns a different color to each style, or I can do my own color setting. And uh, when I hit okay, then those are color coded. And if I'm not happy with those color coding, then I can just you know, edit that and uh, maybe that's just a little too purple for me. So instead of purple, maybe I'll choose, I don't know, red. Get kind of a Christmas theme going, right? And then once I've created a data visualization, you know, I can just go ahead and apply it right here to another. So data visualization, I'll just assign this roof slab and bang, it just applies it to that particular, um, that particular viewport. Now, none of this, nothing that I do in the annotations, none of the uh, overriding the class attributes, none of the data visualization, none of that has any, um, any effect on the model itself. So if I, for example, go back to the design layer, right, um, it appears to uh, change that to the data visualization um, color, but that's, it's actually just a kind of a graphic trick. Uh, really, uh, these roofs are not, not changed at all. If I exit that viewport and I just look at them normally, right, you can see that they have not had their properties changed. It's just a function of the viewport itself that it appears that their properties, their, their graphic properties are, are different. So, um, Sketch styles, data visualizations, these are some ways that I can manipulate the appearance of a viewport without actually changing any of the underlying geometry, anything that's in the actual uh, design layer. So th those are just some of the things that I can do with um, sort of basic viewports. Now, I also have, um, viewports that are uh, sections, right? Um, I don't know why I'm going there. Oh, I do know why I'm doing that. So let's say that I want to create a, a, a section through this building. I've got a couple of different ways that I can do it. Um, in, in the case of the section that's already existing here, let's 
because I've already got one all set up. Uh, this little object here that I've just highlighted, that's a Z section. I just drew that through the design layer. And you can see that it's a section elevation line. And one of the things that I can do is I can navigate to the viewport. So that's the viewport that that section elevation line generates. So the way that I would do that, for example, if I wanted to create another viewport, I would just highlight the plan viewport. And then under view, I would create a section viewport. And I'm just gonna do something kind of wild here. And um, I draw this line and then I click twice in the direction that I want it to be. Uh, we'll go ahead and put it on the section sheet. I can assign what layers are gonna populate that viewport. I can specify what classes uh, are going to be visible in that viewport. I can specify a scale, the level of detail, whether I display planar objects or 2D components, and everything beyond that section plane is going to be showing as a hidden line, but I can, I can change all of those attributes later. And uh, yeah, that's cool. So it'll take it a moment to generate, which gives me an opportunity to have a sip of coffee. There we go. So I'm just gonna move it away here. So there's that section viewport. And you can see that um, it in some ways does not look very much like this one, right? And Part of the reason is that I've taken some time to carefully decide which classes I'm going to have visible for that viewport. I'm also going to look at the viewport's advanced properties and assign it certain attributes. So setting all that up, uh, you can either set it up as you're creating the viewport or you can set it up after you've created the viewport. That can take some time. Um, to get the drawing to show up just the way that you want it. Fortunately, there's the eyedropper tool here. And one of the things that I can do with the eyedropper, which basically clones the attributes of one object onto another object, is I can go ahead and um, specify the class overrides and the layer visibilities and class visibilities and layer overrides, all of these things for viewport attributes. So I'm gonna pick up the attributes of this viewport by clicking on it with the eyedropper tool and then holding down the option key transfers me to the paint bucket mode. And when I hover over an eligible object, you can see that paint bucket tips. So I'll click on it. And I get this sort of uh, barber pole striping around that viewport. And that tells me it's out of date. So I'll just update it. And while it's doing that, we'll wait patiently. There we go. Okay. And um, you can see the detail level here is medium, but I could set it to say low. That'll knock out some of the detail of that model. So goodness, I've got all these trusses in here. That's all taking a long time to render. And of course, this section viewport also has annotations and crops. So I'll go ahead and crop that by just drawing a little rectangle. And then I can proceed to edit some of the classes. So I'll filter out the uh, structural framing. I'll turn that off. Um, update that. And 
Now, not all of the attributes necessarily port over with the eyedropper tool. So there might be a couple of things that I need to uh, fiddle with. In this case, the advanced properties under the attributes tab, I can uh, merge all my cross sections and assign those to my section style class. And then everything beyond, I'll put it in a light pen class. There we go. Oh, it looks a little more like the section that I'm expecting, right? And I can also, under my um, advanced properties, merge my cross sections. Right. So that's essentially how I can create a viewport. And again, once I've gotten all of the um, uh, attributes the way that I want them, then it's pretty easy just to clone them from viewport to viewport. Um, now, another way that I can create a section viewport is using uh, the clip cube. So I'm back here in a view of the model. Again, just a, a save view that I've got. Uh, so we're, we're on the design layer. We're uh, have the clip cube activated. And so I can kind of live section uh, and tweak it and adjust it to just where I want it to be. Right. And then just by clicking on that clip cube, if I, once I highlight one of these faces, if I right click on that, then I get a pull down menu and I've got the option to create a section viewport. So I could do that there. And um, I'll just go ahead and take the default settings. Um, maybe fiddle with them a little bit. Go to advanced section properties. So for line style, use the pen class. Okay. It'll take a moment to generate. Let me drag it off to the side here so you can, oh, uh -uh. I got the wrong one. There we go. All right, so in this case, because my uh, clip cube was a perspective view, it's generated a section perspective um, through the building. And if that wasn't my intent, then I can go ahead and change that projection from perspective to orthogonal and then just update the viewport. And then I've got, you know, an orthogonal viewport. Or I might decide I quite like that perspective. And go back. And another nice thing about viewports is if you're using automatic drawing coordination, um, it's automatically numbering itself and uh, I can give it a title. So I'll just call this my section perspective. Hopefully I spelled that correctly. And this drawing title fee, uh, field in the object info palette draw, ties in directly to the drawing label that's in the annotation. So when I rename the viewport, it renames the drawing label. And that's just an object in the annotations. So I can just, you know, move that over here. Um, for scale, I can have you know, no scale. 
since it's a perspective. Um, so those are those are two ways of creating your section viewports. You can either do them directly from the uh, plan viewport or from the model. And from the model, uh, you can do it from the clip cube. Now, one of the disadvantages of creating the section viewport from the design layer, right, is that if I look down here all the way to the bottom of the object info palette, there's a button for section line instances. And you can see that when I open that, I get two tabs, viewports and design layers. So when I create my uh, section viewport directly from a, a plan viewport, it automatically puts the marker in the annotation space for the viewport from which I'm generating the section. By the same logic, when I create a section viewport from directly from a design layer, it's going to put that marker on the design layer itself. So let's just highlight that and activate it. And if I go to top plan view, command five, there it is, right? That's the section viewport that Vectorworks created when I um, right clicked on the face of that clip cube. And the downside to that is now that section viewport marker is going to potentially show up in a variety of different viewports where I don't necessarily want to see it. So um, I really, it's fine to create your viewports uh, from your clip cube or from the, the design layer, but I tend to prefer to create it from uh, the uh, uh, sheet layer viewport. And if I go all the way back, here we go to this viewport here. If I go back to my section line instances, just because Vectorworks creates it there, I don't have to accept that. I can just deselect that and that marker will go away from that design layer. But I can also add it over here to my, say, A11. If I activate that, then it'll kick me right into the annotation space. And you can see it's created this new section marker right here. Um, and of course, I'm gonna need to fiddle with it so that it has the graphic attributes that are consistent with the rest of my drawing. So I'll change the size and uh, play with it a little bit. But, um, but I find it far more useful, and here, here's the other section that we created. I find it far more useful to have the sections created or at least the section markers that are, that are, that are generating the section in the annotations of um, the viewport. And again, just as a reminder, the procedure is not that you go into the annotation space of your plan viewport and draw a section marker there. You actually start on the sheet layer outside the viewport, highlight the viewport that you want to generate the section marker and section viewport. And then from view, you create a section viewport. So that's, that's the procedure. Let's go back to my save views here. So um, something that uh, I quickly alluded to, but I can talk about a little more explicitly here is the concept of detail level. So um, in this model that I'm using as the basis for today's talk, um, I've got wall styles and those walls have components. They have a structural core, they have uh, drywall on the inside, they have um, sheathing and insulation on the outside, and then stucco. There are roof slabs that have uh, a membrane on top and a tapered section of um, rigid insulation and plywood decking and so forth. So in fact, if we look at this viewport, right, you can see the different materials that are here in the viewport sort of all coming together. Um, so this viewport has a detail level set to high. So you've got three detail levels by default, low, medium, high. They're not really editable. Um, and uh, on this one, on the other hand, I've got my detail level set to low. So 
this is the exact same viewport. I've just duplicated it over. And, you know, if I pull back quite a bit, they look pretty much the same. But once I start to, to close in, uh, I can see some, some key differences between them. Now, certain objects in Vectorworks, I can assign whether those show up at different um, detail levels. So for example, when I create a, a door or a window style, I could specify that my muntins will only appear at high or medium detail, but won't show up in a low detail viewport. And that's true whether it's an elevation or a section or a plan, um, all of those details sort of, detail levels sort of, sort of go together. So that's another way in which I can um, modify the graphical appearance of my viewport without actually doing anything to the underlying geometry on the, on the design layer is with this, this detail level feature. Uh, so for example, if I had a plan viewport and I was going to uh, place that on a site plan, not only would I turn off a bunch of classes so I wouldn't necessarily show the clothes rods and uh, in the closets on a site plan, I wouldn't necessarily show tile as a, as a tiling pattern, I might just make it a solid color, for example. But I might also set the detail level to low so that Windows just appears a single line interrupting the wall as opposed to showing trim and sashes and jams and so forth. So that's another benefit of, um, of doing all of this with viewports is that you can control the detail level on a viewport by viewport basis without altering any of the underlying geometry. Then um, <clears throat> in uh, 2021, there's a new feature in viewports, actually in the drawing title um, object, which has been significantly revamped. Uh, called back referencing. So um, if I look at this viewport and I go into the annotations, you can see that there is a drawing label object. It looks very similar to the drawing label object that I would have shown you a week ago had, if we were doing this in um, with Vectorworks 2020. Um, but its um, appearances can be deceiving. It's, it's quite, um, quite completely revamped. Um, without getting into too much um, detail here, one of the options is that I can edit the drawing label layout. So uh, here I can specify the font and the text size for all of the different text components of this um, object which constitutes the drawing label. So whereas before, if you were to make your drawing label Helvetica, then everything in the drawing label was Helvetica and that's that. Now you can set different fonts and different font styles for different text components of the lab label. But there's also this BR, this back referencing object uh, within the label. And so what that does is that tells anyone looking at this drawing uh, which sheets the section marker for this building sec section would appear on. So it's a way of having sort of a paper navigation back to the section marker, um, knowing that that appears on multiple sheets. And um, I can, um, you see that there's this back reference over here. So if I <coughs> edit that, then uh, I can go to the uh, plugin or instance settings, All right? Uh, that's not it. Mm -mm. Yeah, I can specify which sheet numbers the back reference um, uh, refers to. And so those will automatically uh, change to display, so if I have that section appear on multiple sheets, they'll start to display right here in the title block. So that's a nice little new uh, feature and another thing we get to keep track of in, in, um, in viewports. Now, um, in some cases, like in most cases, I, I probably don't want my crop to be visible, right? So for example, um, over here in this viewport that we just created a few minutes ago. Uh, I don't necessarily want that crop to be visible. Uh, so if I 
um, right click on that and edit the crop. I can go ahead and add a crop. And I can make that crop visible. And so you can see that it's showing it that line. Most of the time, don't want the crop to be visible, even if I have one. But a, a notable exception to that is uh, interior elevations. So there's a couple of different ways of doing interior elevations. There is an actual interior elevation section marker, which you can just drop on the design layer. And uh, it's, a, it's a great tool. It's particularly helpful when you've got a, an orthogonal space. So you've got four more or less 90 degree walls or three or whatever. Uh, and if you don't mind having that um, object appear on your design layer. Um, I tend to create my uh, interior elevations just as individual section viewports. So really, other than scale and class considerations, um, in principle, it's no different from this section viewport up here. Uh, but one thing that's different about it is that I have, uh, instead of drawing just a rectangular crop, right, um, I have a polygon that I've drawn to trace around the outline of the windows and where the ceiling occurs and, and so forth. Um, and in addition to that, I'm going ahead and making the crop visible so that I have this heavy outline that I would expect to see on an interior elevation. So in this case, it is, uh, this crop is serving both as an annotation element in a sense, in that it's visible and it delineates the boundaries of the room, but it's also actually the crop that excludes everything from, from the geometry. So that's pretty useful. Um, in some cases, I might have some complex symbols, uh, like uh, maybe this fan over here. Here's a simpler example. All right, this is a pendant. Um, and uh, often, I'm going to be perfectly happy to have Vectorworks just generate the geometry of that um, as a, um, a 3D object, you know, just taking taking a hidden line view right from the viewport. But one of the options that I have when I have symbols is that if I right click on the symbol, I can edit 2D components. And instead of top, once I edit that 2D component, I get this little component edit dialog box. And let's just go to a um, uh, left view, for example. And uh, it's really hard to see, but um, there is that component there. Um, so when I'm in this left view, I have a, a contextual menu option that is available. And it's only available as a contextual menu option when I'm inside the left, right, front, back, whatever view. And it allows me to generate 2D from the 3D component and do a hidden line rendering in this case. And so Vectorworks will automatically trace the 3D geometry of the 2D, uh, uh, it will automatically trace the 3D geometry of that symbol and generate um, some 2D geometry from it. And when I'm in an exact left view, it will go ahead and override the model view with this 2D view instead. So that's useful if I want to, do some embellishments, like create some gradient shading, for example, um, or I just have a very uh, computationally intensive geometry and it takes a while to render. And so I'll go ahead and um, uh, make this uh, left and I'll go ahead and do the right and again, do the same thing. Right, so there it is. So for all of these different views, front and back cut, again, now I've picked a very simple-minded one because it's the same view on all of those, right? But now whenever I'm in, 
if I go to that, um, let's exit that crop. So if I update that viewport, for example, and I just I have to have this display 2D components. Right, then it will it will substitute the 2D geometry that Vectorworks has generated for me as part of the 2D component for that 3D model of, uh, of course, only if it's in that view. Um, so, for example, uh, on this particular project, I've got uh, these intricate columns, right? Those can be quite laborious to render. So one option for something like that would be to substitute a 2D geometry whenever I'm in a, a side view or a front view. Um, and since I'm here, I should just mention that these elevations are also section viewports, even though they're elevations. They're just sections that are drawn outside the boundaries of the building so that they appear to be elevations. But that's, you know, an elevation is just a, just a section that misses the building. <coughs> So another kind of viewport that I have, uh, in addition to plan viewports, which we've already looked at, and um, the section viewport, is a is a detail viewport. So this is a, a viewport uh, that is, again, taken from a section viewport, but this is a detail viewport of a section viewport. That section viewport is taken from a plan viewport, so we've got a bit of a Russian doll sequence going on here. Um, but uh, but the idea is that I've got this detail call out and it is like the section line instance in my plan viewport in that it is linked to a viewport. And if I navigate to that viewport, it will take me right to it. There it is. Right. <clears throat> and if I right click on that viewport and edit the crop, you'll notice that that crop has the exact same geometry as the uh, bubble of the uh, of the call out in back in my section. So, for example, if I were to change that to say, um, oh, I don't know, maybe a six inch radius. Well, let me do that. Uh, modify that. Um, convert that to a polygon. There we go. And then make these rounded corners, for example. If I go back to my detail callout instances, there it is on sheet A13, activate it. And you can see, well, uh, something fun happened to the text, but Yeah, I'll deal with that later. Um, but you can see that the crop um, also changed. So the crop for the viewport uh, itself and the bubble callout have the exact same geometry. So that, for example, if I were to um, uh, take that object and uh, stretch it, Right, and then navigate to the viewport. You can see that the viewport also stretched. So those are two, those two uh, things are, are interlinked. And I can use detail viewports for, for cross-sectional details. I can use them for little plan details. So if I've got a, a vignette uh, or plan detail that I want to extract from a, say, show a half inch scale plan that's taken from a quarter inch scale or, you know, whatever. Um, all of those are, are options. There's no real limitations on the relative scale of the two different viewports that are linked through this um, kind of detail callout feature. Um, another kind of another, another use of the detail callout here. We've got uh, another viewport, an elevation in this case, right? And uh, here I've got this detail call out. It's actually the same kind of, of uh, object. 
um, but you can see that it is linked to um, another viewport. So in this case, the link is just uh, one of nomenclature. So it's, it's not geometrically linked. In other words, changing the crop of one isn't going to affect the bubble of the other. But um, the numbering of these callout detail, the detail callout and the drawing that it refers to, those are coordinated automatically. So if I go ahead and choose, I could have none, in which case I get this little uh, red broken link symbol, which only appears on screen, it doesn't print. Or I can choose um, all, uh, of all the viewports that are in my file, I can choose which one this is going to uh, refer back to. So I want it to refer back to my parapet detail, right? And so if I navigate to that viewport, there's my parapet detail. If I decide that instead of calling this drawing number one, I want to call it uh, drawing number 25, for example, right? it'll rename it here. Uh, but then if I go back to that view, you can see that it's also changed over here. Um, so this is a really great coordination help uh, <clears throat> in terms of making sure that all of your drawings are sort of consistently numbered uh, from you know one to the other. I'm not quite sure why this one didn't refresh, but it should. All right, we'll have to make a note of that because that that should definitely have updated as well. Interesting. All right, well, make a note of that. So uh, as we're sort of drilling deeper and deeper into sort of details here, I want to kind of take a step back and also um, talk about how viewports can be used for sort of holistic model views or perspectives or whatnot. So here's um, a rent, uh, viewport. It's just in a wireframe rendering. And if you look very carefully, you can see that this viewport um, if I click on it and look in the object info palette, uh, down a little bit past halfway, it'll say camera and no. So um, there's an object in Vectorworks called a RenderWorks camera. Uh, it lives in your visualization palette. It's right over here. And it's really useful to use the camera as the basis for a viewport. Um, most of the time though, I forget to do that. And so I just create the viewport by uh, setting up a save view and I like it. And then I take the view that I like. And then from there, um, so let me go over to the design layer. Okay, there's that same view. Show snap others, right? So that's, I've just, just rendered that real quick. All right, so I could just be in my model on a design layer. I've got uh, all the layers that I want turned on and I can kind of fly around and uh, pick a view that I like and then say, okay, that looks great. And then from that view, I can just go and create a viewport and then I would generate a viewport um, that would uh, mimic this exact same perspective and layers and classes, but over in a viewport on a sheet layer. Um, and that's, you know, quite frankly, typically how I do it. But there's some advantages to having a camera associated with your viewport, because as your design evolves, maybe you want to take a slightly higher view, or maybe you want to pan back or zoom in a little closer, or change the aspect ratio, anyway, whatever. Um, there's uh, all sorts of nice sort of fine tuning of 
uh, views that you can do in the RenderWorks camera that while you can do it without the camera, it's a little, it's a little cumbersome. So if you've created a viewport and you want to add a camera to it, it's actually possible to do that. So uh, let's do that. So I'm just going to, so you see it says camera. No, there isn't one. So I'm going to right click on this viewport and um, I can edit camera or I can just double click on the viewport and go over here and edit the camera. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, there is no camera. How can I edit the camera? Just bear with me. So I'll hit OK, and then I get this dialog box. It says that I can add a camera at this point and link it to the viewport just by clicking on this return to viewport button after I've inserted the camera. So that's, that's good to know. So let's go over here to the uh, floor one model. Oh, we'll go back to the site, actually. Okay. There we go. And under view, layer options, show snap others. All right. So that's about right. So I've got this view. And um, it's, you know, more or less what I want, but I want to fine tune it. So from here, I'm just going to go and uh, go into a top plan view. So that's just command five to a top plan view. And I was approximately over here and I was looking back over there. So I'm just going to go to my render works camera and just sort of eyeball it, just approximate it. Now with that render works camera still selected, right? I'm going to use the back button of my vector works browser way up here in the upper left corner. And I'm going to go back. I might need to go back a couple of times. There we go. And so now I'm back in the view that I liked, but notice that in the object info palette, the render works camera is still selected. So I've got the view that I like, and I have a render works camera selected, and it's approximately in the right place. So there is this match current view button uh, for the render works camera, which is really handy. And what that does uh, is it does exactly what it says. It matches the camera to whatever view you're currently in. So now if I go back to a top plan view and I back up a little bit, you can see that it has changed the camera considerably, right? In terms of its location and um, its field of view. That's cool. So again, I'm in this view, I've matched the, the current view with the camera. And now what I can do is I can fine tune the camera view. So I can um, have the camera distance increased or decreased. I can change the focal length. I can change the perspective a little bit. Right? I can change the camera height, the look to height, right? all of these things. Uh, I can I can do. Let's go ahead and activate the camera view. Right. And so now I'll go ahead and fine tune the camera view. Change the focal length a little bit. There we go. Maybe I pan a little bit left or right. Maybe I move the camera a little bit, pan a little bit more, move the camera. change the perspective. Right. And now that I've got it where I want it, then I just return to viewport and that viewport automatically has a camera attached to it. Uh, let's change the scale a little bit. So let's go, that's because it's, the viewport was cropped. So I'm gonna go back and delete the crop. And let's go back to my camera view. And so now, uh, anytime I change that camera, there we go. 
So the scale needs to be adjusted. I'll just make it a small scale. That's one option. I can just change the scale of the viewport. But the other thing that I can do is uh, these viewports are, if I look at the, in the object info palette, they're um, about 13 inches wide on this sheet. So one thing I can do is I can just make this viewport 13 inches wide. And if I want, I can also crop it. So now that I've got this camera linked to it, anytime I want to fine tune that viewport, I just need to go back to the camera. The camera doesn't exist anywhere except in the viewport. So that's how I get to it. Um, and uh, there we go. All right. Uh, I have so many chats. Let's see. Doo -doo. So I'm going to go back to these chat questions a little bit. Um, uh, I'm going to get back to these. I'm looking at all the chat questions that people have uh, have listed, and I'll go ahead and answer those uh, in a little bit. And if somebody has something really burning, please unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to steamroll on. And, and But I'll get back to these questions. Um, shortly. Um, so um, the couple of other things that I can do with these perspective viewports, right, is I can, um, you know, this is a view of the model. It has a particular rendering style that's associated with the, um, that's associated with the um, viewport. But that, again, like other viewport sort of um, alterations, I'm not actually changing any of the colors of the objects in the model itself. So having viewports uh, is a great way to test out different colors just by overriding the colors of objects on a case by case basis in the viewport or to affect some different, different rendering styles, right? Um, so in this case, um, if, you, uh, if we wanna kind of look at the anatomy of this, of this viewport, uh, for the for the background render, we have uh, this render work style, right? But I could also have, say, an OpenGL. And if I click on the background render, I could make the detail high. I could show textures, but not colors. So if anything has a texture, so the glass you can see in the windows is ever so slightly transparent, even though it's just grayscale. I can make it anti-alias to give it a little bit of fuzz. I can use shadows, right? And then, uh, so that's the background render, which by the way, doesn't refer to what's in the background of the scene. It's really a better name for it might be the underlay render. And then the overlay render is a hidden line rendering. And for that, I've set a smoothing angle to 45 degrees. So things that are curved don't appear segmented so much. I can generate intersecting lines, which gives you sort of, let's, tends to drop out lines a little bit uh, less display surface hatches. So if I have, say, a stipple associated with the stucco, which I do, that shows up. And I can even sketch the hidden line results. So I could change that to say rough, right? And so now if I update, up, if I update that viewport and drink some coffee, updating. Luckily, I have a big mug. There we go. And you can see it's like super sketchy, kind of like me. Um, so, um, so that's sort of a fun thing that you can do with a, with a viewport is um, have two different rendering styles, one a foreground style and one a background style. Now, some of them are mutually mutually exclusive. So it doesn't really make sense to have a hidden line background and a hidden line foreground. But having a hidden line foreground and an OpenGL background is uh, really quite nice. So this is uh, frequently a technique that we use 
would we know we're going to print the drawings in black and white? Um, and uh, that might be on the cover sheet, for example, right? And then if it's early in design, we might make it um, kind of a loose, uh, rough sketch mode like that. But then later in design or even for CDs, we might do a slightly uh, or a, a much more controlled sort of sketch style. And those are all editable through the resource browser. One thing that you definitely want to make sure that you do uh, or don't do um, with these kinds of perspective viewports is you'll see that there's this innocent little button down here, display planar objects. So planar objects are things like arcs or lines or rectangles or whatever that are drawn on the layer plane. And most of the time you don't want to see those in a perspective viewport. You just want to see them in your top plan viewport. Um, and I'll share a little story of why you don't want to turn that on. So a couple of years ago, um, a friend of mine's office, uh, architecture office, called me. Uh, they, were, they were in New York. And they said, you know, we've got this problem Vectorworks file. And every time I render this one viewport, Vectorworks just crashes. And I said, well, you know, send me the file. I'll have a look at it, whatever. And so what they had done is they had, on the site plan, they had this huge polyline, which represented the grassy area of the site. And they had applied a stipple to it, which is fine, looked really nice in plan. But instead of making that a layer screen or a, a screen plane object, they had made that a layer plane object. And then they had turned on their display planar objects in their elevations. So Essentially, there were tens or hundreds of thousands of little stipple lines that Vectorworks had to calculate. And essentially, those were all being seen on edge because it was just a flat polygon representing the grass on the site. And uh, so it was something that, that you know, even if, if Vectorworks had been able to render this thing, and I noticed there was a comment in the chats about machine specs. Um, you know, it just would have been, uh, it just was completely overwhelming. So as soon as we just deselected this display planar object setting, you know, the, the, the drawing rendered just fine. So that is a really innocuous little button. And um, really by default, you should just, that should be off unless you know that you want it to be on, usually in a top plan viewport. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, if your viewport just starts crashing unexpectedly, maybe that's the culprit. Um, um, so um, something that I have in Vectorworks are Renderworks styles, right? So uh, let me pull up my resource manager. So here they are, Renderworks styles. I created a few. Um, there's this uh, uh, CRW that stands for Custom Renderworks Displacement. So that's the style that I've got over here. So um, if I click on that viewport and I look at the uh, background rendering, right? Um, there are a variety of settings that go into that. So I'll just make that a custom render works. And so it has a, back, a sky that is associated with it. Uh, if I go to my background render settings, I'm going to turn on anti-aliasing, but and shadows and textures and colors and displacement mapping, but I'm turning off blurriness, caustics and grass. Those are rendering features that are look fantastic and just take a whole long time to render. Um, and I've played with the settings for all of these different um, uh, characteristics of the rendering. And so once I've got all of those set up just the way that I like them, and once I have my lighting options, set up just the way that I like it, then what I can do is by selecting that viewport, if I go to my resource manager and right click in this window and create a new render work style, right, it'll open up this dialog box and you'll notice if you look carefully that it has copied all of the settings of that viewport that I have just the way that I like it and sort of pre-populated this render work style to represent, uh, to sort of mimic the viewport that I have selected. 
so that's nice. So in a way, it's sort of like a super eyedropper. I've created this style here. Uh, getting a little beach ball, which, you know, that's the signal to have a little swig of coffee. So once I have that style, then I can click on a different viewport, for example. And instead of background render wireframe, I can just choose one of these render work styles. There's a whole bunch of them that ship with vector work. So you can, you know, roll your own, as I like to say, and then just update it. And that'll take a moment. There we go. Uh, you'll notice these look pretty grainy and that's quite deliberate because I'm doing a presentation with you all and I don't want you to, you know, watch my renderings render for um, uh, a long, long time. So one of the tricks that um, I do is here I'm on a, a dedicated sheet layer that's just got my renderings on it as viewports. And if I go to my sheet layer dialog box, you'll see that the default DPI on all these is 72 but this rendering lay, uh, sheet layer, I've set to 36. I can even dial it down to 30. So that's a, that's a workflow that I use often, is that I will uh, set up my views so that I like the perspectives. Then I'll play with the textures and make sure that everything looks good in terms of textures. And then I will start to add lighting. But all of this is being done as I sort of layer on different rendering techniques, all being done at a very low resolution, like 30 DPI or whatever. Uh, because I can, you know, they look really kind of muddy and blurry, but I can still get a sense of composition, of lighting and so forth. And then when I'm really sure that I like the rendering, then at the end, I'll bump the DPI up to something like 200, maybe no more, and then render and, you know, then it can take its time because I know that everything else is right. So that's kind of a, a nice technique uh, to save style, save, save time. So over here, I have a different rendering style, right? <clears throat> this is my uh, white card rendering. So we can look at that. Let's edit that. So you can see that um, my options are anti-aliasing, shadows and textures, but I'm turning off displacement mapping. I'm turning off colors. Right. Uh, everything is low because I just wanted to render this very quickly. And uh, I have a little bit of lighting and then I've got an HDRI background. Uh, there's an HDRI white background that ships with Vectorworks. It's basically it's like a huge sky dome that just projects white light 360 degrees from every direction. And all I do is I just edit that HDRI background and dial it down to about 60 percent so that everything isn't all sort of blown out. So um, when you do this right, uh, which I'm not necessarily saying is what's happened in this case, but when you do this right, you can make these renderings look like they were, um, <clears throat> you know, an old style foam core or museum board uh, kind of model. Um, so I, I can have any number of rendering styles and I can just, you know, from a pull down menu, once I've set them up, I can, trans I can sort of move them from file to file by sharing the resources and I can apply them to different, <clears throat> different viewports. Um, uh, a nice little trick, um, something that many people don't know, here's a viewport. Your trim tool, where are you? Right here, trim tool. Looks like the scissors, I don't want the trim tool, I want the split tool, not the scissors, but the X-Acto knife, right? And that has modes I can split by point or split by line or split and delete half the drawing. Uh, but in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split by line. And uh, I'm just going to draw this line across this viewport. Notice that it highlights red. And what it does is it splits the viewport into two viewports that are perfectly married. Right, so if, if I didn't move it apart, you wouldn't know that they were that they were separate. And uh, that there's a benefit to that. One is, let's say you've got a really huge rendering, you could split it up into you sort of tessellate it into smaller uh, viewports, 
and just render them one at a time, sort of do a test render, and then when you like that, then move on and render the whole thing. Or <clears throat> you can do something fun, like, I don't know, fun. That's fun to me. Um, go ahead and let's make that one. One rendering style. And while that's going, I'll get started on the other one. Um, eh, that one's probably not too terribly successful, but you know, you get the idea that that could be a nice way, for example, even in your CDs to uh, do a, you know, a little, uh, little swatch of rendering, like just in the corner of your building, that could be, that could be quite cool, get a little, little, um, almost Bozar action uh, going on. Um, a couple of quick things and then I will um, try to save a few minutes for questions. Um, going a little bit slower than I thought I would be. Um, there is something called the visualization palette in Vectorworks, uh, oft forgotten. Uh, it lists among other things, all of the cameras in your, ob in your file, but also all of your light sources. So um, if you, know, you notice that this rendering looks a little dead, why? Well, I've got two heliodons in this file, two suns, one for, I think, um, um, New Mexico in the morning and New Mexico in the afternoon, uh, based on latitude and longitude. But you notice that both of these are off. So the way I turn on light sources in a viewport is just by clicking on the viewport and then opening up the visualization palette and then selecting which lights are off and on. So I'll just update this. <coughs> I'll take but a moment. So in other words, if I want to have some different lighting options, well, that is a much nicer rendering when the sun's in the game, isn't it? Um, it looked really gloomy before. So um, uh, if I want to have different suns for different heliodons for different times of day or different times of year, I don't need to put them in different classes. I can just have them all there in my model and then control which ones are off or on on a viewport by viewport basis. But be careful, you can also have too many suns and then you can you know, get a little bit of Tatooine action going on where you've got two different suns and competing shadows. And now it just looks like um, a really bad 1960s era uh, Wild West uh, uh, TV show set. So let's, let's not have that, please. Okay, so uh, visualization, visualization palette, super important for controlling your light sources in your viewports. Um, and then <clears throat> it's a big topic um, and one that I'm not going to do justice today, but um, we really spent the, the whole time talking about sheet layer viewports. There are also design layer viewports. So here's a sheet of details, right? These are the details that are being referred to in the little bubble keys on the elevations and sections, right? And all of those details live on another layer, uh, rather imaginatively named details. <clears throat> But if I click on this detail here, you can see on this detail sheet, you can see that actually, uh, let me select it. You can see that this is a viewport. So this is a viewport on a design layer, not a sheet layer, <clears throat> and it is actually referencing an external file. Why would I do this? Well, it's a nice way for two different people to work on the project at the same time. One person can be working on details while somebody is doing something else, but also, Notice that there are all of these classes in this viewport, these detail classes. And if I go to my classes menu here, um, there are no detail classes in the main file. In other words, a, a design layer viewport is a really lovely way to import a Vectorworks drawing or perhaps a, a, an AutoCAD or other source of DWG that you've imported into Vectorworks that has a completely different class structure, and you can control the visibility of that class structure from within the viewport 
but those classes don't bleed over into your overall project file. So if you've ever had the situation where you like import a surveyor's file into your file, and then you get all of these different classes that you don't know what to do with, like top of curb and bottom of curb and, you know, on and on and on, chain link fence and wood fence and so on and so forth. Well, you know, you don't have to deal with that. You can just create a brand new Vectorworks file with nothing in it, import the DWG, save it, and then reference that as a design layer viewport. And then you can control those classes from within the, the safety of the, of the viewport. All right, well, I think I've just touched like the very tip of the iceberg, um, but I'm gonna go to the chat window here and ask some of the, uh, answer, try to answer some of these questions as quickly as possible. Uh, so Bill wants to know what is merging viewport. I, I guess these are to everyone, so everyone can, can read these if you just go to the chat menu. Um, merging viewports, um, should read merge section viewports. Yeah, yeah. So merging your viewports uh, means that the geometry that is contiguous gets merged in a single poche. Um, uh, let's see. Um, a different Bill, Bill Rios asks, can you create a section viewport style that you could select while creating a new viewport? Um, uh, Bill, I think the short answer to your question is no. Um, some of these settings are, uh, once you set them, they're, they become the default, but many of them are not. Um, and, uh, and so there could be some trick that I'm not aware of, but I think the eyedropper tool is the fastest way to uh, clone your styles. Uh, the generate 2D from 3D, that's super useful, but again, it's very esoteric. There isn't a menu command for it. It only works when you're inside the 2D component of the symbol, and the only way to find it is by right-clicking in empty space. It's mm, not so. May maybe I'm missing something and there's been a new command that's been added somewhere, but, um, but yeah, if you want to create a 2D geometry from the 3D model of a symbol. And again, uh, probably a really good example of how that is useful is uh, here in these elevations uh, with these uh, spiral logs, right? <clears throat> these uh, sort of traditional spiral logs. Um, obviously that, that would save a little bit of, of rendering time. Uh, no kidding. Um, and then um, I was asked what my Computer specs are, I've been running this on a uh, MacBook Pro. I'm running uh, Catalina. This is a 13 inch 2017 MacBook Pro. It's got um, uh, 3.5 gigahertz dual core um, i7 processor, 16 gigs of RAM, um, uh, an Intel Iris Plus graphics card, you know, uh, 1.5 or uh, 1536 megabytes. Um, and then uh, Matthew Coleman from Vectorworks posted the Vectorworks system requirements. Um, uh, I'm actually qu quite happy with this little machine, but I love portability. And uh, the uh, uh, retina display is quite nice. Um, it is not a rendering monster. So if you do like serious hardcore rendering, you're gonna wanna either get a much more capable desktop machine or you can use Vectorworks cloud services to do your renderings for you, which is kind of nice. Um, so, um, oh, we have a couple more minutes. I'm very happy to stay a little bit longer. I know people probably need to get on and do something else, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask additional questions, I'm you know, more than happy to do my best to answer them if I can. Any, any other questions? Yeah. And again, I, I know I've only touched the tip of the iceberg here. Yep. Could you review very briefly again, as Bill Vanderstill, review very briefly that last topic you said about uh, referencing, creating a detail sheet in a separate file and referencing it? Sure, sure. So over here on my detail layer, Yeah, I've got a design layer called details. And um, if you, uh, 
this is a copy of an actual work file. So if I if I were to show you the um, you can see that there's a, there's a broken link for details, but essentially this is a reference to another file, right? So the way I would do that is from a design layer, I would just go view, uh, create viewport. Uh, only instead of creating a, a viewport um, on, a design, on a sheet layer, I would create a viewport on a design layer, okay? And if I select my source, I can select an external document. So I would just navigate over to whatever file that I wanted. Okay. Right. And then I could specify which layers and classes populate this and what the detail level is. And of course, all of that is, is editable. And so this is just one viewport. But the reason that I've cut it up, if you go back to the now the details sheet layer, not the design layer, right? If I go back to, there you go you'll notice that each one of these is its own, probably hard to see because I'm zoomed all the way back. Let me go command four. Each one of these is a viewport. Right. Now, if all I wanted to do is just have my details on the sheet, I could dispense with that and I could just have one big viewport that where I just viewport that over and I'm done, right? But, um, as you can see, I have keyed in these viewports to my elevations <laughs> and to my sections, and in some cases also my interior elevations and my floor plan where there are floor plan details, like there's one right there, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, right? So all of those are all keyed together. <clears throat> And so having them as individual viewports allows me to automatically link those. Now I've broken this because I've just migrated this forward from 2020 to 2021 and I just need to update the, uh, I can try this live and it'll probably blow up in my face, but. All right, so um, that is an unstyled, so I will uh, replace that with my detail call out. Not really sure why it's showing up mirrored like that, but. Uh, I, I used to mirror these willy nilly, but apparently the new ones don't like to be mirrored. So there we go. All right. So, um, so that's just a really cool little thing. And so now I can just go to the pull down menu and there I've got a detail of a viewport outside wall corner. And so I can link to it. So if I ever rearrange my detail sheet and detail 15 becomes detail 17, then that'll automatically update on the, on all my drawings. And so that's why I do this because, you know, these things tend to change at the last minute and it just, makes coordination a lot easier. Does that answer your question, Bill? It does, thank you. Because I've uh, imported files with zillions of classes in them. I'm like, oh my God, how do I manage this? And now you've just explained how you know. managed. Yeah, yeah. now you know. It's, a, I, I, it's like, yeah, basically you're creating a little, a little class quarantine for, yes. <laughs> for all your exotic files. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. So let's see this. Yeah. Hey, Gail. How are you? Yeah. Say, th first of all, thanks. A lot of really good information. Um, sure. I don't know if you've got time for one more question. Absolutely. Okay. So specifically, probably interior elevations, somewhat exterior elevations. I like to switch back and forth at any point in the project between um, an OpenGL colored version to a more uh, black and white basic mm -hmm. version. And yeah. Now, if once I digest what you've told us, I could maybe figure figure this out. But say, okay, that's a good one. So you've got probably some kind of poche for the backsplash. Yeah, that's just a that's just a rendering. That's something I didn't mention is that your annotations can be used for drawing elements as well, right? So, so the backsplash is just a polygon that's a that's a rendering. 
Okay, so that's just applied in your, oh, you're not in, yeah, you're, you're inside your um, viewport. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not anymore, but I was a moment ago. It's in, okay. it's okay. in the annotations of the viewport. Right, okay. so if I want to change that from hidden line, I could go ahead and create a render work stuff, for example. Let's try that. I have no idea what this is going to give, but. kind of dark. <laughs> but, you know, frankly, for something like this, I probably would just do an open GL. And I would not draw edges because I've got the hidden line to do that for me. And um, I go ahead and use colors and anti-aliasing, right? And then for my lighting options, uh, where are you? Lighting options. Um, that's good, that's 65 and turn on ambient inclusion. All right, now let's update that. It'll be faster and it, my guess is it's gonna look a lot better. What I guess what I'm trying to avoid is is doing two different things. So that, so that if I have all these polygons in one, yeah, that, that looks good. Yeah. So I could have we could have made this piece of tile, and and we've done this technique too. It's like there isn't really a one size fits all mm -hmm. um, approach, and sometimes you know there's different techniques. And I mean I like to say, you know, one of the great things about Vectorworks is that there's like 20 different ways to do something. And one of the, you know, um, <clears throat> challenges of vector work is there's 20 different ways of doing something. <laughs> so um, the, unfortunately, OpenGL is not an option for the render work styles because it's not per se a render works uh, rendering option. So you can't do one of these pre-saved um, render work styles with OpenGL in it. Um, so this would be something where you might want to create a little dummy uh, interior elevation off to the side and you would just eyedropper over when you wanted to switch it. Or you could even split it up into two different viewports, right? Using the split function that I showed you, which could wreak havoc with your drawing coordination, but you know. Um, but anyway, back to the tile backsplash. Um, uh, I, I have also like created tile wall classes where there's a render works texture that has a hatch associated with it. Um, and that's okay. But for some of our, some of the sort of tile intensive work that we do, it's not as, you don't have as nice a graphic control as with a tile pattern. Mm -hmm. And so we end up doing something, something like this in the overlay sort of on the interior design side of things. Okay. Okay. Lots of good stuff today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I think I've only covered about half of it and I probably <laughs> dropped the ball on a bunch of things, but hopefully this will inspire people to kind of dig deeper. And with every, with every revision, viewports get more and more powerful and, and also nuanced. So there's, you know, always a good to reread the documentation because you may be surprised what you find. All right, well, thank you all so much. Uh, sorry for going over and um, look forward to seeing you all uh, next month, if not sooner. Thank you, Francois. All right, bye everybody.